Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. We continue with this study on biblical sexuality with the topic of sexual sins now. We're getting into what the Bible names, and, and we will get into some of the implications, of course, that the Bible has with regards to all sorts of forms of sexual sins. And today, the, the one topic that I will deal with is the matter of divorce. And that may uh, raise in your mind a question is, why are you preaching on divorce with regards to sexual sin? And the, the, the reason why, and I'll say this up front, is because I believe perhaps there's only one exception, and perhaps that's not even an exception, to the rule of Scripture that every divorce, every divorce, either is a product of or promotes or necessarily promotes sexual sin. So that when we think about divorce, in our minds, we should have what the Scriptures say as central, which I believe explicitly teaches, not just implies, but explicitly teaches that divorce is akin to sexual sin. Divorce. We saw last week that every sexual act of intimacy, every act of sexual intimacy outside of the marital bond of man and woman is sexual immorality. Very simply put, if you are not married, if you do not have a spouse, you have no God-given right and therefore are immoral in any act of sexual intimacy, regardless of what that is. That's very simply put. We find that Jesus is the one who upholds the creation account, which is where that moral Sexual morality was established. Matthew 19, 4 and 5, Jesus says, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That is morality. That is not what things ought to be. That is how things are. God has established this in creation that this is the only, and it is a good design for sexual intimacy we saw last week. But this is not all that Scripture has to say about sexual morality and sexual ethics. Where do we begin to talk about sexual sins, deviations from this created purpose? I've thought about that a lot over the last few months as I've been thinking about preaching this topic, this series of sermons. And the reason why I start with divorce is because I think that when we talk about sexual sins, when we start to talk about them, we have to start from where righteousness is and move out from there. Righteousness is sexual intimacy within the bonds of marriage. And where we start to see deviance is as Sexual intimacy is experienced regarding marriage beginning there and moving outward from marriage. And so we're not starting with sexual immorality or adultery per se. We're starting with divorce, the dissolution of marriage, which is not in the first place recognized by the state in authority, 
or in the final analysis, but in the first and the final analysis, is given by God. Divorce, essentially, is our main topic, and yet today I want to tell you I'm not going to say all there is to say about divorce that is in the Scripture. I really want us to see just what I've already said, that every act of divorce, perhaps saving one exception, is a sexual sin implicates one or the other or both parties as sinners in regards to sexual practice. That may be foreign to your mind. In our day and age, divorce is as common as non-divorce, if I could say it that way. Sometimes, some years, it's more common. And so we are liable to be desensitized to what the scriptures actually say about it. Now, I understand there are also, there's also the failure of the church to speak redemptively in regards to the gospel to those who have been divorced, that there is forgiveness, that there is restoration, that there is newness of life for the sinner. But I am under the conviction that, if anything, the church has been too lax when it comes to the matter of divorce. I'm reminded of a sermon. I I don't remember what sermon it was, but Dr. Bob Godfrey had preached a sermon years ago with regards to sexual righteousness. And at the time, there was the great debate in the state of California, Proposition 55, on whether homosexuals should be given the right to marry. And the people of California said no. And at the time, what he said in his sermon was that in 1969, in California, where he was living at the time, he remembers no Christian organization, not the church, not the evangelical church at the time, Protestant, Reformed churches at the time, or Catholic churches, speaking out vocally against this new proposed bill that would allow for no-fault divorce. He said he remembers no organized resistance to that bill in the state of California in 1969. And I would say, and my conviction is, is that is very telling when it comes to the church's mind with regard to divorce in relationship to sexual sin. We can tell right away, and many of us can tell right away, sexual intimacy between two people of the same sex is sin. That seems easy. And so we were very vocal, maybe not as vocal as we should have been, to resist that as law. But in 1969, according to someone who was there and a leader in the church, The church was not vocal. I'm sure you had pastors. I'm sure there were pastors that were honest and truthful and faithful to the word of God saying, this is a bad bill. This is a bad and immoral bill. But I think it tells us of the instinct of the Christian. What do we think instinctually about morals when there is no organized resistance No unified voice. And so today, maybe this is foreign to you, but I pray, and I've been praying all week, that God would work in His Word and through it to convince us of this truth. That divorce is a great evil. And I will say this, divorce is always a great evil. Under every circumstance, it is a great evil even a sexual sin. Remember the created pattern for marriage has to do with leaving father and mother, holding fast, and this has, as I argued last week, has to do with burden of responsibility. Who are you beholden to as a first and primary responsible person, your spouse? This does not mean you dishonor your parents the rest of your your life. They don't need you. You don't need them. It doesn't, I don't even believe, mean that you move a certain distance away from them. 
it means that you are beholden to somebody in a unique way. And that uniqueness is prescribed in that measure of intimacy in those words, two shall become one flesh. You are, if you are married, you are involved with a sexual intimacy that you ought never to have had and never did have with your parents. God willing. And it creates a bond that is primary for you. One that is lifelong according to the creation purpose of God. Something much more is at stake with regards to the recognized union of husband and wife than what our society believes. Jesus outlined the nature of this union in our text this morning. I want to read beginning in verse 3 again. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce divorce one's wife? And then they give this category for any cause. And he answered, Jesus answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, so, so Jesus is affirming the truthfulness of scripture when he quotes here what Yahweh and the creator says with regards to this marital union. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two. Now Jesus is speaking. Here's his conclusion. They are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not men separate. Jesus' words affect all of mankind. As I said last week, marriage is a union of common grace. God gives it to everyone in this world, believer and unbeliever. There's no secular spiritual division in this union. God gives it to all to be enjoyed and to be observed and to be cherished and to be, I would say, the center of all civilized life on this earth, humanly speaking. The home, marriage, the upbringing of children, the love and the respect of husband and wife, respectively. And according to Jesus, the sexual act of the two becoming one is to create a bond that is indissoluble and expressed by the sacred union of of husband and wife for life under and by the authority of God, the creator. Notice what he grounds it in. He doesn't ground it in the state. He doesn't ground it even in the vows that are taken by husband and wife, although those are very essential. He grounds it in what God said. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And God said this, and he established this in creation. Therefore, our government, which grants rights of divorce without cause if both parties agree, is in direct contradiction to the creator God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ought to tell them to repent of that. They are wrong as is any government which steps outside of the created authority of God, the the authority of God set forth and revealed in creation and contradicts God who made us and who has the rights to establish what we do. And we know that he has that right not just because he created us, but also because Christ redeemed us. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We have been bought with a price. I'm preaching to the church, I believe, this morning. Here. You have been bought with the price. Glorify God in your body, which regards in that context sexual righteousness, which regards, as we will see today, divorce. Therefore, what Jesus says here is absolutely, unequivocally, for this 
directive with regards to divorce. What God has joined together, let no man separate. You don't just offend the state. You don't just offend your spouse. I would say you offend others as well, your children. There are many other parties that are offended by divorce. But in the first place, you take away what rights God has as the creator and you say no to your creator. You say no to your redeemer. I will do what I will. And some object and say, as the Pharisees does, does, but God makes provisions for divorce in the word of God. Matthew 19, 7, and they said to him, the Pharisees still speaking here, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? Now we find Moses doing this in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 through 4 but they are somewhat misleading with what they say here. Why then did Moses command, they say? Moses doesn't command. Go to verses 1 through 4, Deuteronomy 24. We'll also see this in Jesus' reply. If you're not there, just follow along. When a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, Now, this indecency in her is a matter of of consternation, not just today, it is still today, but it was especially in Jesus' time by two rabbinical schools, the schools of Shammai and Hillel. One was a more liberal school. One was a more conservative school. Neither of the schools believed this meant adultery because adultery was already a capital crime under the law of Moses. So this is not concerning adultery, but but the conservative school, Shalel, believed that this had to do, I'm sorry, Shammai had to do with those who were unchaste in some way. They, he found something serious in his wife, something uh, that had to do with unchastity, not regarding adultery, but in some measure, he would put her away with a bill of divorce. And the, the other school, Hillel, believed that this could be something as common as burning breakfast or something like that. If you found any fault that you, okay, she's not a morning person, that's it for me. And you know what that's like with your spouse, those things that you didn't know about them. You're married and now you're seeing this pattern. Wait, you do that? What? You you don't wear deodorant or whatever it is, right? Well, Hillel said, okay, write the divorce and then let her go. And he writes her a certificate of divorce, he says, as we continue and puts it in her hand and sends her out of this his house, and she departs out of his house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and later the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, where if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God is giving you, for an inheritance. Now, the language does not indicate that Moses gives an order. He doesn't give a command. His his, uh, purpose here seems much more permissive, sort of a, a, a boundary so that things don't get out of order that are already taking place. Now, we don't know when divorce started taking place in the history of Israel. They were in Egypt for 400 years. Most scholars believe divorce was happening because Egypt was a very literal, they were a a very uh, legal society, a very advanced society in that regard. And most believe that the slaves picked up a lot of habits from the Egyptians, divorce being one. And the problem that you have with with Moses is that now you have probably a history of divorce taking place, generations of divorce taking place, and he's not here, evidently, and it's not in the purpose of God to tell Moses or the people of Israel through Moses to stop the practice, but he's trying to create boundaries so that I believe one of the purposes here has to do with a woman just being handed around as some sort of property between men 
hand her a, a bill of divorce, make it known this has taken place. This is not an exchange. You're not just giving and taking as you will a woman for your wife. Now, some say it it goes further than that. There are three views, if I can say this, as we get into the nuts and bolts of the matter of divorce. There's three views within, I believe, faithful expositors, fearful men who are fearful of God, who don't take the scriptures frivolously or, or twist them to their own design. There are three views that are held within people that are faithful to the word of God. One is the view of permanence, with no exceptions being given for divorce in Scripture. The second is semi-permanence. That means you can divorce, but you cannot remarry. The third is permissive. And I hunch myself over like this. I go like this because I believe I'm in the permissive camp. Now, the reason I hunch myself over, I was talking to Brother Jason Barber last week about how grateful I am for Vody Bauckham these days. He's just, he's such a a, a refreshing man of God that I needed in these times. And I heard a sermon of him, from him yesterday after I already finished my sermon. And and he takes the permanence view. And if you have ever heard him preach, he's a very good preacher. And so as I'm hearing him preach, I'm going, am I, do I believe what I believe? And so let me say this to you. What I'm preaching today and what you hear from me today, I do hold this, but the permanence view, those men are serious in their take of the word of God. The semi-permanence view. I mean, we're talking about men on all sides here that I respect. So let me give that to you. So you, you say, oh, pastor, you're just too lenient on this issue. You may not agree with that after you hear me, but I perhaps am more lenient than some, and I don't want to be any more lenient than Scripture. So, very clearly, Jesus says when he answers in verses 8 and 9 with regards to Moses commanding this, he doesn't command it. We see that there. It's it's very clear he doesn't command it. In the King James, there is the use of a, a, of a, of a, noun, a pronoun that would seem to indicate that that maybe it is commanded, but that's not in the original. That he send her away is, is in the King James. It's not in the original. Neither is the ESV and if he, which seems to be if he's going to do it. Neither in the original. It's not explicitly clear on that argument, but Jesus makes it very clear. People are asking me, I'm getting texts here, how did service go? They don't know we started a half hour late. Listen, Jesus makes makes the issue clear here. Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed. Now this allowed here is the same word Jesus used when he permits the demons to enter into the herd of swine. This is not a command, and it's not benedictory. It's not a blessing. And so this is what he's saying about Moses. Moses permitted this, and it wasn't for your good, necessarily. It wasn't to bless you so you could get rid of your wife. This is not a benedictory allowance. He says, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, and listen to this. He goes back prior to Moses, which is why I believe the Ten Commandments all stand. He goes back to the creation account and establishes that morals there are are superseding Moses' permissive allowance of this action. But from the beginning, it was not so. Jesus grounds the morality of divorce upon the same grounds as marriage itself, God's purpose in creation. Jesus is teaching us that the authority of the revealed natural law, if I could say it like that, therefore what God reveals to us when he joined man and woman together is not dissoluble by the permissive actions of Moses in Deuteronomy 24, 1-4. If you're thinking about divorce, forget about it. Jesus says, 
No, from the beginning, it was not to be. Now, this is the question. Are there exceptions? And this is why I find myself in the camp of permissive and not permanence. Because I believe there are there is an exception, at least one in Scripture, with regards to divorce. The exception clause is not found in either Mark or Luke. Neither of them give an exception to divorce. In both cases, divorce or remarriage, one or the other, Mark, remarriage is adultery regardless. And there in Mark, Mark says, if a woman divorces her husband. So there we see there was women involved in this too, to some measure then. But it's adultery. In neither case is there an exception. But in Matthew, we see twice that a, an exception is given. In verse 12 of chapter 19, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, pornea, and marries another, commits adultery. This exception is also given in chapter 5. In the same word, pornea is used, sexual immorality. Why doesn't he use the word for adultery? There's a very clear Greek word. He uses it here. He doesn't say except for adultery. He says except for sexual immorality. This is one of the areas in which those who take the permanence view say, he's not talking about adultery here as the reason why God would permit divorce. Now we're talking about divorce is not allowed. There's no exceptions up to this point until verse 12, Jesus gives now an exception, it says, he, it seems, but that exception is not adultery. It's not the word for adultery. It's pornea, which is generally the word for sexual immorality. Now, it's pointed out, and I'm trying not to do this. I don't really want to get into all of the different views of, of why we're um, convinced one way or the other. But I think it's important because I mentioned it so, so that you would understand. In these days, there was a betrothal that took place. Remember Joseph. He was going to put away Mary privately. He's going to put her away. That meant divorce her. That means divorce her. And he was going to do that privately, but they weren't married yet. So what did that, ha what did that include? That meant those who were betrothed, they already had partaken in vows. Such that if there was sexual immorality, they would have rights to divorce prior to even taking a vows of solemn marriage. So that sexual immorality would not be called adultery in that situation, but would still be a grounds for the dis dissolving of the vows. You understand? And very technically, we could almost see that Matthew is using this exception clause, sexual immorality, as describing that betrothal being broken off. And so those who say this is not an exception, adultery is not an exception, sexual immorality is not an exception for divorce, they say this happens prior to marriage. And you can see where they're going and where they're coming from, and I can see where they're coming from. And to me, it's a valid argument to this extent. And this is where I'm not convinced about it. I believe sexual immorality encompasses adultery and more. In the Old Testament, we see, and we're not going to go there, we see the principle that if you are entered into a marriage and you don't know that your spouse has lost her or his virginity prior to marriage, especially her in the Old Testament law, and you find out she's not a virgin after marrying her, that's grounds for dismissal. That sexual immorality that you did not know prior to marriage, entering into marriage, was grounds for dismissal. That generally would be understood as pornea, sexual immorality. But pornea also means adultery. It's not limited to it. 
So I don't believe what we see from Jesus in this exception clause. We cannot merely say because it's not adultery and it's sexual immorality, it doesn't include adultery. And this is why. Because what we read about, and this is why I'm convinced, what we read about the marriage union is that when a husband and wife two become one, which is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, regarding the sexual intimacy of those two, that is part of the bond of marriage. That is what makes you one flesh. And if you go and you enjoin yourself with someone else, effectively, not necessarily, but effectively, you have broken the bonds of your marriage before God. Now, that doesn't mean you must divorce, but I believe effectively you have already disavowed yourself to that one who is your one flesh and joined yourself to another. That's where I come. That's why I believe this exception clause means that this is the reason why and the only reason perhaps other than one other reason in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 why marriage can be dissolved through divorce. But the question is, is sexual sin still attributed to one or the other of the parties? And yes, the answer is yes. And this is the purpose that I told you I have. There is divorce always, according to Jesus in the Gospels, always regards sexual sins. You say, but what about the one who was divorced? What about, if I could say it, the divorcee? We'll go to Matthew chapter 5. And this, this is very difficult. <clears throat> Sometimes I wonder why I have notes. Look at what Jesus says here. We've already seen that the husband or wife who issues a divorce, except in the case of sexual immorality, is culpable for adultery, sexual sin. Anytime that happens... And so necessarily, if a divorce happens according to that relationship, sexual sin plays a part in it. That's very clear. But what about the divorcee? Verses 31 through 32. It was also said, who divorces his wife? Whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Verse 32. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of sexual immorality, listen to this, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman, that is the divorcee, the one who the husband has divorced, commits adultery. This seems to indicate on the face of it that if you divorce your wife, that's the analogy here. We know this works both ways. If you divorce your wife, this means that you effectively make her an abject partner of adultery. Now, I read commentators that says, obviously, this doesn't mean she's actually guilty of committing adultery. And I think that's true. We have to understand what Jesus is saying in light of the Sermon on the Mount. If you think in your minds sexual thoughts towards a woman, you commit adultery already, right? In your heart, Jesus says. Jesus is going so far the act beyond the actual partaking in sexual sins, but he describes what is, what is actually taking place underneath all of, or beyond the, what's actually happening physically, there are spiritual truths happening inevitably as a consequence without even the actions taking place. And so this, how do I explain this? The woman is not actually partaking in adultery, 
But according to God's creation design, it's as if you are making her commit adultery by putting her away. And I think, I think the purpose of our Lord is to say, you who put her away are the one accountable. You're not happy with your wife? You just want another wife? You're going to do this to her before God? You are one flesh with her. You're going to make her before God in his created purpose an adulterer? And anybody who would marry her an adulterer? I'm not going to take anything away from Christ's words here, but I do want to point out the gravity of divorce here. Today I hear all the time, oh, I'm not happy. I'm not happy with this person. Oh, you should, you know, uh, since five years, uh, after five years into our marriage, we just aren't the same people. Well, repent then. Do not condemn your spouse. Not that the spouse bears that responsibility before God, but in the eyes of God, in his created purposes, they bear the failure of your dismissal, which is really hard to consider. This is the words of Jesus. You make her an adulterer. In other words, divorce is not a loving action. I, be, I keep hearing this word, this phrase these days. It's an act of self-love. And by that, they mean I can do whatever I want, which is the definition of the sin of selfishness. And they want to put love on it. Love does not make your spouse an adulterer, or anyone that would join your, themselves to your spouse. All of this means that merely the act of divorce, merely the act of divorce, except here for sexual immorality, which I believe is the one exception Jesus gives, is an act of sexual deviance and disorders God's creation. Now, you're going to say, and you're going to think, and I know you're thinking this, but what if he's physically abusive? Or what if she's physically abusive? I've seen that too. Or what if they're verbally, or what if somebody gave this analogy, what if they're spending all of our money? Or what if I don't respect him? Or what if I can't look him in the eyes? Or what if I think that he's not doing well for our children? What about all of these other circumstances? And the scriptures say, no. Why? Not because they don't matter. I, I'm a firm believer that God gave civil laws to constrain all of those other failings within marriage. A man beats his wife, he ought to be held accountable. Uh, listen to this. This is radical. A wife dishonors her husband Publicly, especially in the church, we, I believe that woman should be held accountable by the word of God. I believe the things that tear marriages apart, if we use that language, that the, the world uses as excuses for marriages to be torn asunder, should those things be held accountable in church? Absolutely, within the body. However, none of those things are exceptions to God joining man and woman, husband and wife as one flesh for the purpose of divorce. None of them are exceptions. You say, he could kill me. And the church should do everything in our power to keep that from happening. Society should do everything in its power to keep that from happening. 
but that is not, according to Scripture, grounds for divorce. And I know all of the arguments, but he doesn't love me, and love is essential for It's not grounds. And here's why I want to say that so clearly, because sexual intimacy matters before God in the marital relationship. I I believe this union of two becoming one is so important before God, and it has to do with sexual intimacy, that all of those grave evils that we can do to each other are not exceptions for divorce in the eyes of God. You, You see what my purpose here in this is? is to convey to you some measure, because I tried to do this two weeks ago when I said the church has too low a view of sexual righteousness in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But I believe it's true with regards to divorce. You guys, you guys, that's a terrible way of speaking, right? If you're in a marital relationship and you're not fighting with every fiber of your being, with every means at your disposal, not to listen to this world, not to give in to your urges of selfishness, not to give in to your urges of self-preservation. Every means at your disposal to listen to the word of God, to believe it. You should do that. Everything you can do to remain married, you must do. Regardless of every lie or every opposition that's real to your union. Before God, you must. I think that is the gravity of the situation. Now, I've alluded to one other exception given in Scripture with regards to divorce, but I want to say, and I'm not, we're not going to look at it because this isn't really a sermon about divorce. Do you believe that? You don't believe that. Maybe you shouldn't believe that. But it is a sermon about divorce, but not the whole idea of divorce in Scripture and all it says. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7, if you're married to an unbelieving spouse, which happened a lot in those days, Corinth, the city with sexual sins all over the place, Some, one of the, uh, the members of the, the husband or wife becomes a Christian, now they're married to an unbeliever. Paul says, if your spouse wants to stay with you, you do not divorce them. You don't separate from their chorizo is the the Greek word. Again, in that context, it means divorce. Paul says the only exception here is if they want to leave you. And the principle is because we are saved for peace. In other words, you can tell your unbelieving spouse, you're not divorcing me. I'm a Christian. We don't divorce. I believe Paul is saying, you are going to create divisions beyond what that marriage would divide. And I don't pretend to know all the reasons. Paul does not give all the reasons as to why he permits that. But that is a very clear exception. Not you, the Christian. You are not allowed to divorce them, the unbelieving spouse. But if they want to separate from you, you allow them. That's the only other exception. Whether or not that still involves sexual sin, I would say, I would assume it does. Because the principle is clear. The principle is that when you are married, any relationship other than death dissolving your marriage, any other way of dissolving your marriage is sexual sin. I believe that's the pattern from creation. Practical application, that's very practical. But I want to give you, I don't even know how many I put here, several applications, and they'll be brief. Have you been divorced already? Divorce is common in the church. Many divorcees in the church that I know were divorced as unbelievers. Later they became Believers at some point were married or remarried. Many of those relationships that I know of would be guilty of this adulterous union. 
does that adulterous union continue? There are some that say, if you remarry under these circumstances as an adulterer, you are continually and perpetually an adulterer. I don't believe that's what the scriptures teach. I believe it's an act of adultery. And I do believe that the cycle of adultery must end somehow. You don't, even as the principle in Deuteronomy 24 says, you don't divorce your current wife and go remarry your former wife. That just increases the cycle of deformity. But we also need to know there is mercy, just like with every other sexual sin. There is mercy for those who have been divorced. This is not a matter of if you've been divorced, you cannot be a member of the body of Christ. Remember Jesus met that woman, the Syrophoenician woman, at the well. She had five husbands. We can never take license when it comes to sin, but we can always know that Christ in his atonement for sin is sufficient to cover us. That means we don't sin willfully and presumptuously, but that means when we recognize our sin and repent of it, confess it, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us our sins. So don't go to your divorced sister or family and relatives and friends and say, wow, my pastor told me that you're a sexual deviant and I won't look at you in the face anymore. Give them the gospel if they don't know. If they do know the gospel, the second application, if you believe the gospel, you've been in divorce, you know somebody, encourage in society the truth of God's word on the matter. You see, one of the methods of Satan in this world, one of the lies we hear all the time is that you cannot speak on an issue because you failed on that issue. And here's what we need to recognize. I don't speak up here as a pastor because I, have, you go to the Sermon on the Mount, I've failed that all over the place. I come to you speaking the word of God. It's God's word that we uphold. And we hold ourselves accountable. They say, you failed in that, you transgressed in that, and we say, I have transgressed. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, and I'm one of those sinners. But that does not mean that we don't uphold the truth. Do not back away from the truth regarding the sin of divorce because that sin is close to you or you know of it or you've been involved in it. Uphold the truth because it is the word of God. Very clearly, if you are considering divorce, I ask you to come to me, Kyle, the elders, the leaders, godly men, Pastor Ron, come to us, seek every means that the church has at its disposal to help you. And even after all of those means have been exhausted, rather commit yourself to death than divorce. Till death do us part. And you say, but I will be miserable. And I would encourage you that God promise us everlasting joy, but he does not promise that that joy will be full now. In the sense that it's continual. In the sense that we don't have, we just sang the song, right? Some through the fire and some through the flood. Through the valley of the shadow of death, through persecution, through the stake, through fire, through all of these things, we are more than conquerors. Through an unhappy marriage, we are more than conquerors. We do not give up what is right because it's hard. Verse 
Because this life is a vapor and it's going to give way. And everything you sacrifice for righteousness sake will be restored unto you infinitely more. Infinitely more. You say, but give me some encouragement. How about Christ? You say, you're just getting to the end of the, the, the sermon and now you're talking about Christ. Listen, if it's not for love of your spouse, if it's not for love of what is righteous before God, which it ought to be, it's not for the word of God and the reverence of it, it ought to be. If it's not for the sake of the church and the body of Christ, if it's not for the sake of your children, recognize this, that your marriage, be it as unhappy as it may, your union, man and woman, husband and wife, illustrates a greater union between Christ and his church. A union that will not fail. And every time, especially within the church, a divorce happens, but I would argue that even in the common grace aspect of all divorce, that picture of Christ and his church is obscured, sometimes lost. The reverence that we have for Christ, again, brings us to a sexual commitment to righteousness. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 and 32. Therefore, a man should, look at where Paul, by inspiration, look at where he grounds in the same category of created purpose. Look at where he grounds the union of Christ and the church and how he does so in consummation. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. I think it can be rightly argued that every marriage in the first place, is not for the sake of the husband and wife in the first place. It's a gift from God for us. But this glory outdoes the temporal glory. This is an eternal glory. And our marriages have an opportunity, and actually do, follow this example between Christ and his church, which is an everlasting salvation purpose in God from before the foundation of the world. So this union is till death do us part. These marriage, this temporary marriage now is till death do us part. Anything else is sexual sin. I pray that our convictions would align with Scripture so that at least in the church we would uphold the glory of God as husband and wife. Christ in the church. He loved us and he gave himself for us. And that union will never be dissolved. Let's pray. Father.